Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I wish to welcome you to the Peter Lahey Lecture tonight with Senior Minister Catherine McLean. I also wish to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, and the Nakota Sioux. I am very excited about our speaker tonight, who I can truly say has made me personally think very deeply and meaningfully about what diversity means in our lives. Catherine joins us tonight as a leader to many in her capacity as a minister, an author of two books, and as a sought-after speaker at conferences and retreats. My name is Naomi Krogman, and I am a professor in the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociolo Sociology, and also an associate dean in the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research. I'm pleased to welcome you to the fourth lecture this season in the Lougheed College Lecture Series. The Peter Lougheed Leadership College has been in existence since 2014, and the University of Alberta has had the fortunate privilege of the Right Honorable Kim Campbell serving as its founding principal for the past three years. She's way in the back there. We also have the wise Dr. Martin Ferguson Pell here, vice principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College, who is also a professor in the Faculty of Rehabilitative Medicine. The Peter Lougheed Leadership College is for third and fourth year undergraduate students from, from across faculties here at the U of A who take part in an immersive leadership program. They attend this speaking series as part of their teachings and do various other reading, writing, discussing, and experiential learning. The broad purpose of this college is to allow these students to truly engage with the idea of leadership across time, cultures, and to address present-day challenges in all facets of leadership. Tonight's event will run until 7.15. It will start with the lecture by Minister McLean, followed by a conversation between the speaker and the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. I would now like to introduce tonight's speaker. Catherine Faith McLean is Senior Minister at St. Paul's Church in Belgravia, a 10-minute walk south of the University of Alberta. She works with a congregation made up of professors, students, scientists, business people, artists, foresters, social activists, LGBTQ plus persons, politicians, children, teens, old people, very old people, refugees, writers, sunny people, and grumpy people. She also works collegially with other faith leaders in the area. Catherine earned her degree for ministry at Harvard, and earlier a literature and languages degree at Dalhousie. Catherine also has a doctorate in preaching from the McCormack Seminary in Chicago, for which she received the top award. Recently, with a professor at Queens, she published Preaching the Big Questions, a few years ago, Catherine was part of the writing team for the United Church of Canada's new statement of faith. Her upcoming book, Theology of the United Church of Canada, is a joint publication about the denomination's theologies and basic beliefs. Here at the university, Catherine has presented about leadership to the School of Business Leadership Certificate cohort, about world religions and the LGBTQ plus community to the Pride alumni chapter. And Catherine was able to be a Guinness Book official witness for the biggest dodgeball game in the world. In case you didn't know, being a Guinness witness is a perk of being a minister. She would like all you PLLC students to consider a change in your profession. The United Church of Canada has congregations from sea to sea to sea, and in Bermuda, and Catherine leads churches in the Maritimes, Toronto, Yellowknife and Canmore, but she's mostly at St. Paul's United and ha has come here um, 14 years ago. She was on a CBC radio panel about rhetoric in the U.S. and Canada 
and is a popular speaker for Sunday morning congregations, retreats, and conferences. C Magazine, Best of Edmonton, called her the most passionate sermonizer in its annual Best of Edmonton issue. She was a delegate to the inaugural World Communion of Reformed Churches, a more, and more locally is a founding member of Appreciation, an ongoing event which acknowledges the December 6th massacre by supporting young women in the Bow Valley. Catherine reads voraciously, and you hear that coming through in her sermons. She loves to sit on an oceanside veranda, whether it's sunny or foggy. One of these days, she will get back to her blog, but in the meantime, there are interesting people to meet, including you, Catherine. Thank you, Naomi. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. I want you to know how much I respect the studies that you are engaged in. And I know that as students at this university, you are really busy. Um, you're reading, you're writing, you're doing math, you're doing labs, um, you are making friends, you are, are dancing, you're doing all kinds of things that are really important. And I want you to know how much I respect that and how glad I am that you are in school here. And um, thank you. I am very honored to bring you a few thoughts this evening. <clears throat> I like stamps. I, I write quite a few letters. And I like stamps. So the people at the post office in Oliver have come to know me. And when I go in, they know it's not going to be a short conversation. Because I will mail something, and then I will say, now, do you have any new stamps? Well, and if you don't, does the other teller have any new stamps? And so I, I come home with the most beautiful stamps. Uh, there's one that came out this year to celebrate Canada 150, and it's the, the shape of a maple leaf, and there's a, a moving, an apparently moving rainbow flag on it. There was an absolutely stunning stamp that came out for the celebration of Eid. And for Diwali this fall, oh my word, go to the post office tomorrow morning early and get some if you can. There are be they're just beautiful orange and red stamps with, a, with a, a shining light for Diwali, the festival of light in the Hindu tradition. So I buy these stamps, and the people who work there have come to know me well enough that there is sometimes a little refrain that happens. It happened when I bought the rainbow stamps. It happened when I bought the Eid stamps. And it happened when I bought the Diwali stamps. A different clerk every time said to me, you know, not everybody likes these. And my response is, you've got to be kidding, they're beautiful. And the response was, some people complain. Diversity. Hmm. I expect that most of you, like me, are always evaluating your relationships, your language, the way that you connect with other people, strangers and friends, the things that continually are um, exposed to you about strangers and friends, about their identity, and about, for that matter, who you are. And that this concept of normal life and diversity may be something that you, like me, are constantly evaluating, looking for changes, looking for new ideas. And what I want to bring you tonight are some thoughts that I have. And you know, I work in the United Church of Canada. And my assumption is that most of the things that I am doing day by day are not things that most of you are doing day by day. I visit people and ask about the state of their soul. I pray with people. I read scripture. I prepare sermons. I deal with all the list of people that Naomi has mentioned. And it's, it's my hope that from the particularity of my life and my practice, there might be something that will inform your leadership your leadership studies, and the leadership that you are engaged in right away. The United Church of Canada has been part of making change in this country since the beginning. We are a liberal, progressive, constructive denomination. We're very good at making apologies to people for things that we've done wrong and for picking up and figuring out how we can better be a faith community and also a better neighbor in, in um, local cities, but also across the nation and around the globe. And one of the places where we find that we meet neighbors is in migrant communities. 
I'm thinking of the Rohingya people who are migrating out of Myanmar into Bangladesh. And many of you have had opportunities to offer funds to help in that. We in our church certainly have. I'm aware of migrants moving in that geography. I'm aware more personally of people migrating out of Uganda and other countries where being part of an LGBTQ plus identity may be illegal, it may be dangerous. And I'm aware of people who are migrating for those reasons and coming to our country where they're supposed to be safe and coming to many of our faith communities as well. I'm aware of migration and the difference that we meet in people who are coming out of places that are unfamiliar to us, whether they are geographic places or personal places. And so I want to tell you a story. And you know, some of you know this story. And I would hope that when you show up to hear a speaker, you'd already know most of the stuff. And there might be a thing or two here or there, a book referred to, or a turn of phrase that's new. But it's my expectation that there's a whole lot of you who know this story. And I want to tell it anyway because it's a really important story about migration and it's about a people who were living in Egypt and they were slaves. And when they'd arrived in Egypt, fleeing drought and famine, they'd been very well received. They had become part of the public service, they were prime ministers, all kinds of good things. But over the years, you know, people tend to forget about individuals and communities who are different. And so the Egyptians had kind of forgotten and these people had become slaves. And they were very successful slaves. They did, they did quite well for themselves, but they were still slaves. And the people in power watched these slaves and said, you know, we're, we're, we're suspicious of these folks. And right now, they're brick makers. And we don't like how well they make the bricks, so we're going to make it more difficult. So the overseers are going to go to these people, and they're going to say, the bricks that you make are too, it's too easy, and you're slaves. So Tomorrow, you start making bricks without any straw in them, which is to say just mud. How do you make bricks out of just mud without straw? You can't do it, but that was the story. And so you see the oppression for these people intensified and intensified. And finally, they called up a leader who went to the chief of the government and said, let my people go. We oughtn't to be slaves. We are a people with dignity. Let my people go. Well, you know how these stories go, right? The answer was no. And so this leader came back 10 times, came back, and came back with an arsenal from God. Yes, you're right. This is the story of Moses, and it's in the book of Exodus, and it's a gorgeous story, and it's really long. And so I'm telling you, the really brief one, because we only have 45 minutes, but the plagues are things like the river being turned to blood so nobody could drink it or clean their clothes or anything. There were frogs and gnats and flies and livestock disease and boils and thunder and hail and locusts and darkness. And then the firstborn died. And finally, the king said, all right, you can go and get out of here real fast. And so the Hebrews left Egypt. And Moses was the leader. And when he got to the water, you may know the story, he parted the Red Sea and they walked through on dry land. But this is the bit. This is the bit. I've been doing this for a very long time. I didn't discover this verse until about five years ago. I've been reading the Bible for money for 35 years. <laughs> and five years ago, I found this sentence, OK? This is the sentence. There were about 600,000 of them, plus the children. A mixed crowd also went up with them. And livestock in great numbers, both flocks and herds. A mixed crowd also went up with them. A mixed crowd. They were not all Hebrew slaves. They were not all the people of Moses. They were not all the people who would become the ancestors of my faith. A mixed crowd went up with them. I want you to know this story because deep in biblical history, there is this concept of diversity that when the people of God were fleeing and going to the promised land, they did not go alone. They had a mixed crowd. And I want you to know, I could find nothing that indicates that Moses and his friends decided that that mixed multitude should become like them, that diversity should become uniformity. This mixed crowd got out of slavery and went with Moses. And I think that's a fantastic story. And if that's all you remember from tonight, that's fine. It's good biblical teaching. And there you go. So diversity is a religious imperative. 
quite possibly also a moral imperative, but certainly a religious imperative. So now I want to think with you a bit about diversity as a social construct. And I want to take you just a little bit into the work of Northrop Fry. Northrop Fry was teaching at the University of Toronto in the 1960s when he wrote the book called The Educated Imagination. It's about 100 pages long. It's a great read. It's a massy lecture. Um, so you could pick it up, put it in your back pocket, and read it over lunch sometime when you're kind of bored with biology or zoology or chicken studies or whatever it is that you're spending your time doing. The Educated Imagination by Northrop Fry. And Northrop Fry was a literary critic and he was a biblical critic. He did criticism and he created a way of looking at literature that has formed the way the English departments in this country and around the world have functioned ever since. People like Margaret Atwood are deeply indebted to Northrop Fry. He also, incidentally, was an ordained United Church minister. So he wrote, oh, I have to tell you one other thing, the danger of being a thinker. Northrop Fry, like many other great thinkers, you think about this the next time you go to a class and you're wondering what it is that your prof is getting on about. Thinkers, he, like many thinkers, was watched by RCMP intelligence for his participation in the anti-Vietnam War movement for an academic forum about China and about activism to end apartheid in South Africa. The professors whom you and I have been privileged, privileged to, to study with do amazing work. So what did he say? He wrote, when you stop to think about it, you soon realize that our imagination is what our whole social life is really based on. The fundamental job of the imagination in ordinary life is to produce out of the society in which we live a vision of the society we want to live in. He calls it a social mythology. And he was writing in the 20th century, and things may have changed, but this bit has not. He said, for instance, every society produces a mythology. In the Middle Ages, the mythology was protection and obedience. And those seemed to be eternal verities, things that would never change, but they did change. A hundred years ago, he wrote, the mythology was independence, hard work, thrift, and saving for a rainy day. Do those things look immortal to you? I don't think so. But a hundred years ago, independence, hard work, thrift, and saving for a rainy day were the social mythology. Unlike the Middle Ages, where the mythology was about protection and obedience, think, for instance, of the lord of the manor whose job it was to protect everyone and to feed everyone, but in turn, everybody had to be obedient. So he goes on to say, that as people with free imaginations, we undergo some training. You can't um, move unless you've learned to walk. You are not free to play the piano unless you've had lessons. So we train ourselves, and he says, we train our imagination. And out of a trained imagination, an educated imagination, we come up with the social constructs that make our society work. And I want to offer to you that for us in this century and this decade, we are working hard at coming up with social, social mythologies about diversity that will work, that will make us good neighbors, compassionate community members, and loving families. Diversity. All right. Maybe you, like me, when you get a little bored, you go to YouTube and maybe you watch some advertisements once in a while. And you're probably familiar with the advertisement of the Toronto Transit Authority streetcar stopping in the middle of a boulevard in the large, large red refrigerator. And people go up to the refrigerator and there's something that says, you need to say, I'm Canadian. 
right? You know the ad? Yes. And somebody goes up and says, je suis Canadien, and something goes bing. And someone goes, I am Canadian, and something else goes bing. And the light bulb goes on in the people who are gathered around, and they know that what they need to do is to say, I am Canadian, in a variety of languages. And there's one young woman who's a little confused, but she finally says, watasi wa Canadien des. And then, then we have this face of joy and surprise. When another young man comes up to it and says something in Mandarin and his language is detected, it's a gorgeous, social, mythological presentation of a beer ad. I am Canadian. And whether or not you enjoy beer, and you may not for a variety of reasons, the ad is fantastic because it's offering us, as advertising does, a reflection of who it is we think we are or who we would like to be if we spent more money. So what other cultural meta-narratives can we draw from when we are looking for ways to not merely defend, but progress with being a loving diversity as neighborhoods, as a nation, and as families? Well, there's the beer ad. There is our prime minister who says diversity is our strength. I think that's also the CFL logo, is it, or the theme this year? D strength in our diversity or diversity is But in any case, the prime minister stood up in Canada House in London and talked about diversity being our strength and that it's really hard, but that that's what we do. So that's two places, beer ads and the prime minister. Another place where we look for social mythologies is in our religious life. So First Nations creation stories about the earth being built on the back of a turtle and the woman who fell from the sky and the diversity of nature that is part of that creation story. There is the meta-narrative of the biblical exodus, of which Moses was the leader. That's another meta-narrative. And there's, there's one more. You probably have come up with 16 in your own mind by now, but the meta-narratives that move us in a large imaginative sense into an understanding of social diversity being what we want, what we're striving for, what we're working for, what we're continually wondering about. And that's the idea of the hero. So you might think of um, young Ray in Star Wars, or for those of you who are purists, Luke Skywalker. But I want to tell you about another hero. And I want to acknowledge right off that we are in the fourth wave of feminism. We know about social media. We know about the intersectionalism of third wave feminism. Th this particular story takes place before first wave feminism. So there's a few things that you need to just kind of let sit you know, in a corner as I tell you the story. Abram's wife, Sarai, was bearing him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to her husband, Abram, I'm having no children, so go to my slave girl. Maybe you will obtain children by her. So Abram listened to the voice of Sarai and went into Hagar, the Egyptian, took her, and she conceived. When Hagar, when Hagar conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress, Sarai. And then Sarai, who saw the contempt in her maid's eyes, said to her husband, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave you my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. And Abram said to Sarai, the slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. And Sarai dealt heartily with her, harshly with her, and Hagar ran away. She ran away, this young slave girl, pregnant, and she stops under a tree, and she's crying. And get this, God shows up. 
You wondered, eh? You're coming to hear the Reverend Doctor, and you're wondering when God is going to show up. Well, I'm on page five of eight. You had to wait that long, maybe. So God shows up. And God says to, I mean, the angels of God are always saying this. They're always saying, don't be afraid, what's the matter? As though they didn't know. But anyhow, that's the way the story goes. Don't be afraid. God says, where have you come from and where are you going? And Hagar tells the story, how her mistress has been hard on her, and she is carrying a child, and she is sitting under the tree, ready to die. And this is what the word of God is. Go back. Submit to your mistress, and I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And God named the child Ishmael. You know where I'm going now? Yes, thank you. Ishmael, through whom the lineage of our Muslim neighbors is traced. The religious leader. And the mother is Hagar, this girl who's pregnant crying under a tree. This is the part, though. It's a great story, but this is the part. This is the part. Then Hagar says to God, I name you. You are El Roy, which means God of seeing or God who sees. So, we have this vulnerable, abused young woman, pregnant, crying under a tree, and she gets to name God. In my world, that is a really big deal. She gets to name God, and she gets to be the mother of one of the most remarkable religions on the face of the earth a religion that is about love and compassion and wonder and looking after each other, and she gets to be the mother of that whole thing. And what I want to bring to you tonight about that story is that in this world of difference and diversity in which we live, how well do we hear the voice of the vulnerable this woman, who surprise, surprise, becomes the mother of a great people, a great leader, brings her leadership from a vulnerability that is poignant, that is visceral. Tree, tears under a tree, pregnant and alone, and she becomes a leader out of great vulnerability. And so one of the things about our normal lives, living as a diverse people and learning how to better be in diversity is to acknowledge the vulnerable among us and the voice for future and the power of that voice. She gets to name God, and she names God God who sees because God saw her distress and the potential. Diversity. One of the issues with the number of migrants in the world is the trope in which a lot of us live, which is, well, come on over here. It's way better. And sometimes it becomes a one-way relationship can I teach you how to make porridge and how to go to the market and buy eggs and you know, what carrots look like, what color they are here, when it's all of me or us, maybe me, saying, come on over to what I can show you. A uniformity. This is good. But real diversity is in putting aside the uniformity and being in a relationship so that we get to know each other and get to learn about each other, and that we change. Hadia Roderick wrote in the Globe and Mail on November 4th an article on Section F called Who Belongs on Bay Street? 
She writes, my parents moved to Canada to offer me the promise of the North American dream. If I was smart enough, if I worked hard enough, I would get what I deserve. But on my way to becoming a lawyer, I learned that success isn't necessarily about merit. It's also about fitting in. And as a person of color, that's a roadblock that comes up again and again. Pure merit is a myth. As a person of color, there are roadblocks every step of the way. Do you feel that you fit in? Can you even go to law school in the first place? Do you get an interview? Do you choose not to reply because you don't see yourself represented? represented? If you get the job, can you fit in? When she wrote her initial application, she considered, do I sign my given name, Hadia, or do I use my middle name with which I might pass as white, Jolene? She used her given name, the one by which her parents called her, Hadia. She got into law school. She got into a great law firm. And her story is well worth reading, but she writes, I was to be visible yet invisible. I had to make them believe that I was a black girl they could spend two hours in a car with on the way to a hearing in Barrie, listening to Bob Dylan and talking about summer vacations. When what I wanted was to sing along with Nina Simone and talk about inequality. She wanted to be herself. Now here's my confession. I read, that, I read that and I thought, right, girl, you ought to be able to talk about what you want and be who you want and take that two-hour drive and be accepted. And then I thought, I don't know who Nina Simone is. <laughs> I had to look her up. I've missed this whole part of jazz music that is outstanding. Thank you for inviting me to do this lecture because now I looked up Nina Simone and I'm much the richer for it. I'm someone simply, simply someone sitting on her couch on a Saturday morning, reading the Globe and Mail, reading the story by Adia Rod Rod Roderig, and realizing that I'm part of the culture that prevents her from feeling that she's fitting in, because I don't know her music. Being interested in diversity and promoting it is about relationships, about getting to know each other and being willing to change, to learn things, and to become different than we have been. I think I own every book Margaret Atwood has published. I think I do, which means it was a pleasure when The Handmaid's Tale came out, and Alias Grace for that matter, because I already have the books on my shelf. There's a difference in the novel Handmaid's Tale and in the movie. The protagonist of Handmaid's Tale, I want to tell you this, that book came out just after I left Boston and Cambridge. So when I was reading about the hangings on the, on the wall of Harvard University, those were walls and gates that I'd walked by and sat under months before this book. And then these images of people being hanged because they did not fit in. Some of you have seen the movie, some of you, it's, I'm not giving it away. But it is a repressively conservative state bent on annihilating homosexuals, abortionists, and religious sects other than their own, and resettling Jews, old women, and non-white people in radioactive territory. So the protagonist in this movie has been on her way to escape with her partner and her daughter, and she gets captured, and her name becomes the name of the man to whom she is assigned for that period. Her name becomes of Fred. Of Fred of Fred. The understanding is that when she goes to become a concubine with another man, she will have his name, and she will be of Glenn or of someone else. Her name is erased. In the novel, her name does not appear. There's been a 30-year conversation about whether, in fact, it does appear, but it is not clear. Those of you who like to watch the movies, the name is in there. It's a bit of a giveaway, and Margaret Atwood is involved in the production of that, so it must be the way she intends it. But my point is that for Offred, 
her identity as a woman, as a mother, as an educated person, as a partner, as a thinker, is entirely erased for the uniformity of the state. It is dystopian literature for sure, and Margaret Atwood has written a number of them since. But from the times that she wrote Edible Woman and Surfacing, right through to writing Handmaid's Tale and Mad Adam, Margaret Atwood presents us with the threat that any of us who have a concept about the way things should be best and are going to impose that uniformity on others are going to create this evil intent and this deep and harsh violence for others. Diversity and uniformity. So back to Hagar, a hero who gets to name God, one who will bring diversity into the religious traditions of the Western and the Eastern world. That voice from the most vulnerable is something that faith traditions are called to listen to very carefully. And tomorrow, the Prime Minister of our country is going to make an apology to LGBTQ 2S plus persons for the way they have been maligned in the RCMP, the public service, and the military. And I want you to know when you're listening to that, that there was a faith representative on the committee that composed the apology. And I'm proud to say that he's an ex-moderator, not ex-past moderator, of the United Church of Canada. His name is Gary Patterson. He lives in Vancouver. Because we want to be listening to the voices of the vulnerable and acknowledging that in our desire for efficiency and excellence and ease and wealth and uniformity that we have hurt members of our neighborhoods, our nation, and our families. The quest for diversity, for more and more diversity, the, the, the quest that we are on to become more diverse and better neighbors is something that calls us to be confessional and humble. We keep trying. We keep trying. Diversity of race, diversity of language, diversity of skin color, diversity of religion, diversity of sexual identity. There's another kind of diversity that I want to think with you about for a few minutes tonight. And it has to do with the beautiful world in which we live. Some of you study zoology and biology and all kinds of different animals, and you study oil and engineering and geology, and you know way more about this earth and the power of this earth and its critters than I do. But I read about it. And I want to draw to your attention the, reading, the writing of Barry Lopez. Barry is a naturalist and a biologist, an American writer. He's written for Harper's Magazine and other things. And he's written articles about things like, what would happen if you were in an airplane for 10 days straight, a cargo plane, and you just went from Dubai to New York to London to LA to Beirut in a plane that's taking cattle or diamonds or motorcycles or racehorses. He's a curious person. He writes about nature. And the piece that I want to draw to your attention is in a book called, um, it's, in a, it's a, an article called Yukon Charlie. And Barry Lopez often writes about the relationship between the physical landscape and human culture. So in that piece from the airplane, he's writing about what he can see around the globe as he travels for 10 days with hardly stopping and how disorienting that is. 
but he writes about the physical landscape and human culture and the spiritual and aesthetic and historical dimensions of wilderness experience that we have subordinated to our interest in security and wealth and greed. So just give a listen to this. He's in Alaska. In search of water free of silt, we turn up Sam Creek. Flocks of gold eye with their high foreheads explode vertically off its tannin-colored waters. Mallards sweep past and Arctic loons labor by, dip-necked and humpbacked like seals. It's as though we had barged in. Thousands of multicolored flowers float amid stalks of horsetail ferns at the creek's edge. Snagged on one of the scabrashies is the hooked iridescent tail feather of a male mallard. My hands are slick with river silt, stiffened by wind and sun. I can hardly grasp it. He writes that we go to the wilderness to find animals, to find beauty, to find awe. But we rarely go to the wilderness to find people. And he notes that there is a wilderness act in the United States of America in which humans are construed as aliens, urged to make their visits relatively brief and to leave no mark of their passage, to banish evidence of ourselves in the wilderness. So I think of our national parks and the twofold purpose of those parks, and one is to keep the beauty and the awe and the natural violence that is part of the park geography and the other part of our Canadian natural parts, which is to give us the opportunity to be in the wilderness. And how do those two things go hand in hand? And the point that Barry Lopez makes is that if we are able to think of wilderness without us in it, then it is incomplete. So he writes about being up on the Yukon and the Charlie Rivers in a canoe with a friend before this particular wilderness act comes in, before the people who live there are asked to leave. And he writes about the mallard ducks and the river full of silt and the cold and the water and the slick so that he, can't, he can hardly reach out and grasp what he wants to at the side of the river. And he says, but without the people, it isn't complete because we are part of the natural diversity. Because we are part of the natural diversity. And I think that's rather humbling. Unless you spend your life in ecological studies and environmental studies, it may be something that you, like me, only spends a little bit of time thinking about. But when we're thinking about normal life and diversity, it's about people and relationships but it's also about our relationship with the earth and how we belong. And yes, we're attempting to become better stewards of the earth, but to think of that coming first from a place of acknowledging that we belong, that we belong on the Yukon River in our canoe, that we belong in Jasper National Park with our running shoes on, that we belong in Cavendish National Park in our swimsuit, that we belong. That diversity is not simply an esoteric conversation about relationships, but it's also, also about that very tactile sense of belonging to and in this earth. So the keg has done it too, that place where some of you perhaps once in a while have a burger and fries or something of that nature. The ad yesterday on the Grey Cup, the most Canadian word is not a, the most Canadian word is not serviette, the most Canadian word is not, says the keg, took. The most Canadian word, says the keg, that keg, that restaurant and pub, the most Canadian word is welcome. And they go on to say, and at the keg, at the keg, 
we think everyone should feel that way. Here we are again with business reflecting back to us who we think we want to be. That ad is full of people with all kinds of different faces, beautiful each of them as they are. That the most important word is welcome. And that's the thing about normal thoughts on diversity, is that somehow if we are able to welcome one another and our place in the earth, but truly welcome, not just as a sense of welcome, come into my house and see how I do things, but a sense of real welcome where I want to be in relationship with you, I want to get to know you and find out what makes you tick and what your worries are and what you're afraid of and what you think about my religion and where it maybe has some edges that you could help me with. That kind of welcome that really means cross the threshold and sit down and look into each other's eyes and have a meal and get to know one another. That, I think, is the way that our normal lives embrace diversity and a better way of being diverse with one another. So here we are. With Moses, we learned that diversity is a communal activity. The Hebrews are escaping the bad guys, but so is this mixed crowd, this group of people, we don't even know who they are, but they get to leave too. It is a community activity, and it is a community identity. And we don't single-handedly go about it. We don't single-handedly support people at Bissell Center. We support them as part of our common life. It isn't enough to single-handedly support LGBTQ plus persons. We support them as part of our common life. And we don't single-handedly eradicate racism either, do we? We do it as something, as a community in our common life. And in our common life, we're listening for those vulnerable voices. Hagar sitting under a tree, pregnant and crying. And she's the one who gets to name God. And so we're listening in our common life for the voices of the vulnerable and the dispossessed and the abused. And we're reading. We're reading Northrop Fry, and we're reading Margaret Atwood. We're reading Barry Lopez. Some of you are reading the Old Testament like me. Diversity is about how we decide who we are, the stories and cultural meta-narratives that we choose to tell. And we have the agency to choose the norms that become that diversity. We listen to the cultural narratives, we listen to the traditions, we use our educated imaginations, and we decide as individuals and then as neighbors, a nation, and family members how it is that we are going to tell our new meta-narratives. And so the question I leave you with is how you do that as an individual or as a community. Religions are really good at that. Literature classes are really good at that. Humanities classes are really good at that. Leadership classes are excellent at that. How do you take what's important to you in those norms and bring them into an understanding of diversity that is going to move our neighborhoods and our nation and our families forward. And so it's my hope that telling you a bit about some of these writers who've inspired me, Barry Lopez and Thomas King, and Margaret Atwood and Northrop Fry, that there may be people and writers in your own practice whom you want to pay attention to in a little bit of a different way, whose work you want to talk over with friends, or maybe you're just going to go straight to the bookstore and have a look for some of these things. Thank you for your attention.
my pleasure. Now you have a this is yours. I think I expected his because it was here. The reason I'm not sitting in my normal, normal place is because I had an issue I had to deal with and I thought I might get a phone call, so I better sit out in the back in case my phone rings. But I've turned it off now because too bad for them they didn't phone. <laughs> well, this was extremely interesting and particularly because um, when we talk about diversity, religion and faith are roles that are kind of a two-edged sword because it seems to me when people share a particular religious view of the world, the idea is that, that the view is the most important and it doesn't really matter the characteristics of an individual. Um, I am not religious, but I had a religious upbringing. And when I was a little girl at Sunday school, there was a little uh, hymn we used to sing, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, black and yellow, red and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. In other words, it didn't matter what color you were, you were loved. And I'm gonna to come to this to talk about some of the current issues in the United States too, but, uh, but on the other hand, religions also provide in many ways an understanding of the world, an understanding of what God is and what people should be. And so on the other hand, very often the dogma of religion becomes a way of dividing people. And here are you, as you say, reading the Bible for money. You've got to figure your way around this. How do you deal with these, this duality between religion on the one hand, which sets up, believe now, now part of it is belonging to a very liberal progressive denomination, but not all people who share your broader religion, Christianity, take that similar view. Absolutely true, absolutely true. And it's, um, it's one of the reasons I love my work uh, is because I am constantly seeing the way the presence of God shows up in surprising relationships and that that the very foundation of religious faith for me is about relationship. God's relationship with us, our relationships with each other. In the Christian Trinitarian sense, God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the relationships there, that that's the foundational essence of who we are. And if, as I believe, the essence of who we are in a religious sense is about relationship, then it's also about um, loving and looking deeply into the other one which is not about judgment. It's not about saying I'm right and you're wrong. It's about saying this is what I've come to understand about the world, myself, faith, ethics. What have you come to learn? And what do we have to share here? That, that I the word dogma is so interesting because dogma, theology, doctrine, they all kind of mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think they're wonderful because they are the basis of how I function as a Christian. And they are the basis of how other people function in their religious traditions. So they're a way that we can identify and be different. And because I know who I am as a Christian, I can be open to the other person. I don't want the other person to become like me. I mean, I may be fantastic, but it's going to be really boring if there's two of me. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing in my faith. My experience of it is, I think, quite remarkable. I love it. And I am really interested in somebody else's understanding and experiences in faith. And I have no need of making them like me. Um, and that is part of the Moses story, you know. The Hebrews got out with all these other people, and there's nothing in there that says they had to become like my ancestors in faith. Mm. They went off and became a whole bunch of other different people who believed different things. And that's the pleasure of the Hagar story, too, that Christians and Muslims can be best friends because we have a shared family history, we're cousins. Now it's also true that the people we have the most arguments with, often they're the people we love the best, the people in our families are cousins. And so when there are religious differences like that, that's a lot of what it's got to be about. It's a lot like sitting together um, and having a, an argument as family members, we do that as religions. And I acknowledge that it's dreadful and it's violent, and that part's wrong, because we can be open to each other. I've probably talked enough about that. <laughs> Well, no, but it, it's a very interesting question because one of the things that we do in, in the college 
um, in our, when we get into the second term of the first, the first year is we look at a uh, new workshop on living in a pluralistic society because it's all very well to talk about we have charter rights, we have all these things, but the fact is that sitting in this hall tonight are people who have profound and passionate views that are not the same as one another. And how do we live together and how do we create a society and how do uh, young aspiring leaders think about the role they can play making that happen? A number of years ago when I was living in Los Angeles, I went to a talk given by the novelist E.L. Doctorow and he called his talk The Politics of God and he said that he had a fondness for the less, quote, dogmatic religious sects. He liked Reformed Judaism. He liked, uh, you, know, you know, progressive Protestantism. He liked religions that were not, in his view, dogmatic versions of their faiths. And he coined a really wonderful expression. He said, doubt is a great civilizer. And so he was approaching it slightly differently from what you're doing. Mm -hmm. He is saying that in his view, people who have beliefs, it's great to have beliefs, but it's also wonderful for them to accompany those beliefs with a sense of doubt that they might not be the only way of seeing things. And as long as they carry with them a bit of doubt, now, I used to always joke about the Unitarians, you know, prayed to whom it may concern, that's maybe a little, <laughs> a little doubtful. But the idea being that if, you, if you, you can have a belief and you can live by it, but if you also harbor the view that maybe it's not the only way of seeing things, that then it makes it more difficult to be that dogmatic person, that violent person, uh, the person who is uh, you know, going out, whether it's in Northern Ireland or in the Middle East or someplace, and, and attacking people who don't share your view. The reason um, I went, well, there are two reasons I went to Harvard. One is they let me in. But um, <laughs> the other reason I went is that at Harvard Divinity School is something called the Center for the Study of World Religions, incidentally founded by a Canadian, Wilfred Cantwell Smith. And that center meant that in all of my studies, there was a diffusion of people of different religious traditions, and I was learning it. At that point, in the 80s in Canada, there were not seminaries that were teaching Judaism and Islam mm. and um, Sikhism and so on. So I went and I, I learned that there. Now you'd have a pretty hard time getting around as a United Church minister if you didn't know the basics. Mm -hmm. I also want to say that I went to Simchat Torah at the Reform Synagogue here and learned about their, their dogma, their understandings, their practices, which are quite different from mine, and yet we share an understanding of social ethics and values and um, persons and ecology and all kinds of things. But our understandings of God are quite different. And oh my word, I had a wonderful time. I ate and I danced and I played with children and I got to hold a Torah. You know, it's interesting, uh, Christopher Buckley, whose father was William F. Buckley Jr. And some of you may know, William F. Buckley Jr. actually, <laughs> I know because he married a woman from Vancouver. That is to show you how parochial I am. But William F. Buckley Jr. was an American conservative writer who edited a, a journal called the National Review. And he was one of sort of the intellectual leaders of conservatism in the United States, and quite, quite conservative. But he was, and he was a Catholic. And uh, his wife was not a Catholic, but he was a Catholic. And uh, his son, in writing about his parents, said that his father searched his whole life for the true Christian. And the closest he came was a friend of his who was a non-observant Jew. Mm -hmm. And this sort of gets to this notion again of dogma as opposed to living a principle or living values. And for many people, religion becomes a turnoff if it seems to be too caught up in the dogma that you have to do things in a certain way as opposed to how you live how you actually treat people. And I think in virtually all religions, there are teachings about how you treat the poor, the least among you, the weak, the, uh, you know, the, you know, the person you know, attacked by people on the road. I mean, all these kind of things. I don't think there's a religion that doesn't create a challenge to people to respond to those human things. But the real question is whether there are also principles that you know, allow you to make the difference. Uh, between your views and somebody else, whether you're allowed, you know, if an idol worshiper is down a well, are you entitled to put the lid on, as some teachings are. So I think that, that, that it's a, I mean, I, you know, I was a politician, which a lot of people think is a hard job. I think being a minister must be a very hard job 
because trying to reconcile the moral questions that people have about how you live with the principles and shared uh, theology of a religion uh, is, is, is not always easy. No, it's, it's a huge privilege. It isn't always easy. The book that's coming out, Theology of the United Church of Canada, um, there are about 14 chapters and it's different areas of dogma. And in each of those, there is an explanation of how our understandings of those things have changed over the years. So part of the pleasure of the study of theology and dogma is seeing it change and making it change. And that happens in a lot of religious traditions that we have, that we make great changes. We don't do things the way we did in the church in the Middle Ages. And it might have been beautiful, but if you showed up at worship in the Middle Ages, you would have brought your cow to sell, and you'd be talking to people, and the priest would have been doing something up there in the front, and you probably wouldn't have been singing any great hymns. Um, things change. And so part of the thing is in the tradition of faith to be open to the change and making that change happen. But from a position of understanding what's been before and being able to articulate it. I'm going to turn to the audience in a, middle, in a minute for, for questions, but there's one other thing that I wanted to raise uh, from what you said, and I think it's really very interesting. Um, our theme in the college this, this, these two weeks is diversity, which, you, which you've addressed in a number of very interesting ways. And one of the things that I think is interesting about your approach, and that is worth remembering, is that diversity is not tolerance. Diversity is not you know, seeking certain numbers. Diversity, the value of, of diversity, it only really works or it can only really be real if we change ourselves. So diversity isn't about a lot of different people even coexisting and working well together. It's about people allowing themselves to be changed by exposure to the other. And for a lot of people, that's a very scary thing. Mm -hmm. It's why they don't want their kids to associate with people not like them. They're afraid they will become different. And that, I think, um, is a very, very interesting and important idea about what we really mean by diversity. It, you cannot have diversity without growth, without change. And I think you, you, you talk about that in a very interesting way. And I think it's worth going to see other people who have been courageous and done those things. So in our congregation, we became an affirming congregation, which means that we're not simply tolerant or even welcoming to the LGBTQ plus community, and for that matter, all other kinds of difference, but that we're proactive, we're part of Pride Parade, we're writing letters, we're showing up, we're throwing dinners. And people said, this is gonna change our church, isn't it? And the answer is yes. And isn't it grand? Oh, the other thing I wanted to raise too was this notion again that shared religious beliefs, a shared theology, a shared uh, or shared way of, of expressing this in a community is a wonderful way of bringing diverse groups together because it's around the beliefs. And it's interesting in the United States today, for most of American history, the notion was the United States is not a, nas a nation state, uh, you know, as traditional European mm -hmm. states. It wasn't based around a singular cu single culture, that it was based around shared adhesion to a set of constitutional values, a set of principles about how people would live in political society. And even from the very earliest time in the United States, there were people from all religions, there were Jews, there were Muslims, as well as Christians, and the Christians were in many different denominations, many of whom were at each other's throats, um, uh, you know, when they, uh, uh, when they, when they could, 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 could do it because they disagreed so strongly. But what brought them together and made them Americans was the belief in certain principles of the relationship of the citizens of the government. And now, what we see in the United States, there are a lot of very disturbing things happening, but is this um, moving away from the, the uh, respect of constitutional principles going back to more mm. kind of tribal, dogmatic, uh, theological principles? And so it's part of this very interesting Hmm. possibility that a belief system can in some ways draw diverse people together, although some belief systems divide people. And, but the belief systems aren't just religions, they can also be the kind of secular religion that a belief in a constitutional society mm -hmm. creates that allows people and all of their theological differences to coexist mm -hmm. together. I guess it's the things that really matter are not benign. Um, 
loving relationships, that's, families. That, that's a very interesting, you want to repeat that, it's a very interesting offer. Things that really matter are not benign. Mm. Very. So the things for which we have passion, um, our friends, our studies, our families, it, it's not benign, it's not passive. It's active and that means it's dangerous. Mm. Uh, when we tell someone that we love them and we want to spend the rest of our lives to them, we're opening ourselves to all kinds of vulnerability. It's very brave. The weddings I conduct, I conduct a lot of weddings and those couples are brave. And, um, and it's the same with religion then. Mm. You know, it's dangerous. You can get hurt. And you can also be part of something that is deeply about human nature and belonging and relationships. That's pretty spectacular. I'm going to open it up for questions and comments, but we have our, our uh, catch microphone down here. Kelly, we will come and get it and do the... This is really great fun. because I, we know, can I just, want to see this work. It's a microphone. It works perfectly, and we can throw it into the middle of a crowd for somebody. Okay. Brilliant. Oh, oh that's fantastic. Isn't that great? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was at a conference once where they had one, and I came back and yeah, said, good. got to get one of those. An opportunity to, for people to ask questions. Yeah, sorry, I can't, I'm blind as a bat, so somebody up there has to be the pointer. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's great, you see, because you can get right yeah. into that. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, thank you. Yes, you can. Some of the people who we welcome to Canada um, are not as accepting as you are. Some of them uh, are misogynistic. Some of them have no tolerance at all for sexual minorities. So my question to you is, how do we, how should, uh, how should we relate to people such as that who are now a part of the Canadian community? It's a really great question. It's a really great. On a national level, we need to continue to be doing the work that we're doing around um, rights and expectations of relationships, that everyone has dignity, that everyone deserves to be treated well. And we need to figure out the hard question of how to deal with uh, small communities or individuals who do not believe those things. Um, being open and progressive uh, doesn't mean being naively saying anything goes, and, and I respect that that's exactly what you're asking about, and that's why, and it's really important because the work that I do and the work that we do in all our various ways is challenged by that. It's not simply meeting someone of difference, but it's meeting someone um, who would be putting down or hurting another person, and we have to be able to have strong enough community values and legislation to deal with that. We have legal systems and prisons for a reason. And we also have community conversations and opportunities to meet um, more casually that are also really vital. Community leagues, open houses. Other questions? Can you see? I can't. Yeah, over here. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It's just foam rubber. It's really... Like a Stan Peters quarterback. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, missed, I missed the comment. I, missed. I did too. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, kind of, what is your advice, I guess, to our group of young leaders about tackling... Um, resistance to diversity in our society today, kind of when there's barely tolerance for diversity in some situations, and how do we begin to have a conversation about relationships when there's barely tolerance? So kind of your advice on resistance. Uh, resistant, resistance is vital. Um, there's a group in Saskatoon every year who have a resistance event. It's a memorial um, event around the Holocaust in Europe, and it's about resistance. It's remembering that we need to resist. And so resisting means um, finding friends, finding a community of people. Um, social media can be helpful for that, but really it needs to be face-to-face. -face. 
gatherings of people who have the same kinds of questions or the same kinds of concerns. And it, it may mean finding um, religious groups or groups on campus or um, service clubs in the city that are working on things and becoming part of it and learning. It's, it's about finding community. It's about not being alone, not being isolated. And I, I think that we build a lot of bridges when we're able to identify another community that's doing similar work and we become side by side. So when the um, murders happened in the, in the uh, mosque in Quebec City last year, a whole bunch of us showed up at the Mac Mosque in the West End. Um, I wore my clergy collar because I wanted to be identified as a Christian minister. And we stood around that mosque for Friday prayers. We were making a statement about resistance. And we were a real mix of people. We were the people who went with Moses across the, the Red Sea. Because some of us were religious and many, most were not. But we found there a community of people who wanted to resist. And we got talking and a few phone numbers got exchanged. That's what we need to do. Was that, what, was that the question that you were asking about that? I wondered if you were talking to people who resist, uh, well, I guess that is, Does that resist diversity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We seem to be hearing a number of disturbing stories out of campuses across Canada about certain conversations getting shut down. Could you comment on that and what your view is on, on what's happening in some of those? Some of those conversations are about hate and we do not need to be hosting conversations that are about hate. Thank you so much for your talk. I, I would love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts and what you think the relationship between diversity and power is. That's a really good question because one of the possibilities is that uh, the, pow the privilege of power gives us room to think about diversity and to make things happen. That when we are in our, when we are the vulnerable individuals, that there's less room for policy making or community building around diversity because we are simply trying to heal ourselves or have enough of the basic things. So certainly power, the privilege of power and the, the freedom, the, the peace of mind, the spaciousness to talk about and move together in diversity is a, is a really interesting question. It, it really is a possibility. I think we do need to use our powers. We need to be leaders. We need to say, I have the privilege of reading these books and thinking about things with this community. And so I'm going to use that power to do something positive and constructive in this world to promote an honest, progressive, loving, relational diversity that will work. And I'm going to join with others in doing that. I think that's where we use it well. I suppose it could be used to shut people down, and maybe that's what you're getting at. I'm not sure. Um, in which case, we need to keep inviting people into the conversation. And with a, a view that indeed there are things about which we may be proven wrong, it has to be an open-minded conversation, not simply a conversation that says, I know something really good that I need you to learn. Um, but a, a real conversation about diversity may mean that I, I'm, I'm still going to learn stuff. Yeah, but use the power and have people around you who can check you on that power so that it doesn't be, so that you're still humble. I think it's certainly true that appeals to identity or justifications for exclusion are often limit, are often linked to power. That's I mean, how do people, you know, often will, will seek political power by defining themselves as the voice of those who are either the, the, the silent majority or the unrepresented minority. In other words, I think that these ways of thinking are not just linked to social stability in the sense that as we are welcoming as we expand, that we create a, a, in some ways a more joyful and more uh, harmonious community. 
but that very often what people are seeking is the opportunity to create power relationships. Uh, that, uh, so, so fostering identity, fostering difference, as opposed to, uh, see, diversity is, is this notion of difference, but within an entity somehow, that we say people are diverse, but we're part of a society, we share goals, etc. cetera. Uh, I, I belong to an organization that talks about shared societies, finding the mechanisms by which diverse communities can live together, mm -hmm. because 90% of the world's countries have minorities of at least 10%. Mm -hmm. So if we don't find the ways to, to live together, we can't do it. But for others, it's actually a source of power to be able to put pit people against one mm -hmm. another. And part of that definition of being different within something mm -hmm. is the definition of where the edges are. And mm -hmm. there have to be edges. You know, we are human beings, there have to be edges, and those edges are, in my mind, my humble mind, going to be about, um, about hate and about indignities being done to people, and, and that there are edges to diversity, for sure. Not everything goes. It's time for us to break now for our students to do the master class, but before, I want to ask just one more question. Because in your world and in, in the community of, of being a, a you know, Christian minister, you must have seen extraordinary changes, uh, even in the congregations of a, of a progressive uh, liberal Christian denomination. Uh, could you have imagined the, the, the views of your parishioners today, 20, 30 years ago? We are doing things I had never heard of as a child. Yes, it, yeah. it's kind of, um, yeah, it's exciting. Yep. So maybe scary for the people who don't like it, but exciting for those who welcome it and embrace it. I think it's scary for all of us at some point, yep. and that's not a bad, fear is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's scary, but it's not bad. Catherine McLean, thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs>